Good morning. Thank you so much for coming and uh, participating in this wonderful place. N nice uh, topic. I'm, I'm anxious to talk to you about this. And uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Gim, for giving me the opportunity. Astrophysicist and director of the New York City's Hayden Plana Planetarium, which is located on the west side of uh, Central Park and 79th Street. Um, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson was asked by a reader of Time magazine, what is the most astounding fact you can share with us about the universe? <clears throat> so I'm going to read his response. The most astounding fact is the knowledge that the atoms that comprise life on Earth, the atoms that make up the human body, are traceable to the crucible, crucibles that cooked light elements into heavy elements in their core under extreme temperatures and pressures. These stars, the high mass ones among them, went unstable in their latter years. They collapsed and then exploded, scattering their enriched guts across the galaxy. Guts made of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and all the fundamental ingredients of life itself. These ingredients become part of gas clouds that condense, collapse, form the next generation of solar systems, <clears throat> stars with orbiting planets. And those planets now have the ingredients for life itself. So that when I look up at the night sky, and I know that, yes, we are part of this universe. We are in this universe, but perhaps more important than both of those facts is that the universe is in us. When I reflect on a fact, I look up, many people feel small because they are small. And the universe is big, but I feel big because my atoms came from those stars. There's a level of connectivity. That's really what you want in life. You want to feel connected. You want to feel relevant. You want to feel like you're a participant in a goings-on of activities and events around you. That's precisely what we are, just by being alive. <clears throat> and so this is my comment. This is about as eloquent as one can get, having a naturalistic understanding of existence. Uh, you have to overlook, if your worldview is like mine, you take the Bible seriously, that Dr. Tyson was asked about the astounding facts. Those of us, in, in our, we would quibble with his facts, and we would disagree with Dr. Tyson about where the atoms of matter heavier than hydrogen came from. But that's beside the point. I, anyway, this is a starting point here. And <clears throat> I wanted to ask you, how would you answer this question? What is the most astounding fact about the universe? Uh, each of us would probably give a different answer. I really thought very hard, trying to come up with something cogent, and I don't think I have. But I put down my best answer at the moment. It can change, subject to change. This is what I'm saying. The incredible size, complexity, and mystery of the universe hints that our creator's capacities are off our chart of comprehension. It's beyond beyond at least my grasp to even come close to wrapping my mind around what's out there. But that's just me, and I would be at the end of the presentation. If you have any thought on this, I'd very much appreciate your thoughts on this. <clears throat> so this is a schematic representation of our understanding, current understanding of the universe uh, consisting of 300 sextillions, these are ap approximations, 300 sextillion stars and more than 100 billion galaxies arranged in a sphere. This is from our vantage point of the Milky Way. 
right here, and 93 billion light years across. <clears throat> so let's look at our Milky Way, zero in a little bit. Um, we have about two to 400 billion stars and about 100, at least 100 billion planets arranged at disk. Um, the diameter of this flat like disk is 100,000 light years. Um, here's the sun's location, the solar system. And the diameter of the solar system is nine light hours. This is 100,000 light years. Uh, the solar system's diameter is nine light hours. If you were to make a, a model of the Milky Way, this kind where this distance would be 15, 50, 50 kilometers, the distance in the solar system or the size of the solar system would take up two millimeters. It's kind of the, our relationship, the solar system's relationship to the Milky Way. So here is our solar system. The sizes of the planets are approximately to scale, of course, not the sun. And the distances are definitely not to scale. Uh, but if you travel with the speed of light from the sun to the earth, it takes nine minutes from, the, from light to get to our earth, to get to all the way to the end of the um, solar system Pluto, it's four and a half hours. Um, in um, five years ago, we launched a space probe toward Jupiter called Juno, and 4th of July, this 4th of July, it arrived at Juno after five years of travel. Um, it was traveling at a leisurely space, leisurely pace of 11,000 miles per hour. That's not the fastest we can do, but... <clears throat> there was another space probe launched um, 10 years ago called the New Horizons space probe that reached Pluto or the vicinity of Pluto. So it would take us five years to go from here to here, 10 years under, in, in this New Horizon um, space probe, uh, scientists use the gravitational force of Jupiter to speed up the space probe, kind of a slingshot type manner. So it got there quite impressively in 10 years from here to here. This is uh, uh, schematics of our sun and uh, some of the nearest stars in our Milky Way. Uh, it's not obvious here, but the nearest, because this is at an angle, these circles. So this distance from the sun to the Centauri system is four and a half light years. And it says here on this scale, this is 10 light years, so it's not obvious. but the realities are that from the sun to the Centauri system, it's four and a half light years or 25.8 trillion miles. And if we were to use a spacecraft traveling at probably at a very respectable 50,000 miles an hour, it would take a mere 58,900 years to cover this distance according to my calculations. So where does it leave us? It, the, all these numbers and distances give us the idea that we are quite isolated. Even if we could travel with the speed of light, even then we would say we are quite isolated from the rest of the universe. Now, we have a disconnect. Um, in Job 38, the Lord says to Job, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth, declare it if thou hast understanding, and then going down to the bottom, whereupon the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstones thereof, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. I interpret, and I'm not the only one, that the sons of God refer to created beings other than humans who were here before us. And they were shouting for joy. 
which means that we live in a friendly universe. They are happy to have us coming into existence. And surely they would want to interact with us, right? We would, it is our notion from the biblical perspective that we are welcomed in a universe and we want to be part of it. But the astronomical data shows us a great isolation. So we have a disconnect here, as I mentioned before. <clears throat> so let me just mention a few e events or a few instances from the Bible in Genesis 28, 11, 12. At sundown, he, Jacob, arrived at a good place to set up camp and stopped there for the night. Jacob found a stone to rest his head against, head against and lay down to sleep. As he slept, he dreamt of a stairway that reached from earth to heaven, and he saw the angels of God going up and down the stairway. Connection, no problem, right? <clears throat> Uh, in Daniel 9, 21, 23, Daniel writes, As I was praying, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the earlier vision, came swiftly to me at the time of the evening sacrifice. He explained to me, Daniel, I have come here to give you insight and understanding. The moment you began praying, a command was given. And now I am here to tell you what it was, for you are very precious to God. We don't know how Gabriel could get to Daniel in a matter of 10, 15 minutes from wherever Gabriel was when he received the command to come to Daniel. Traveling at the speed of light from the throne of God to earth in straight line probably takes centuries. <laughs> but we... We don't know, but I, I think I'm safe in saying that the throne of God is not in a solar system, okay? So if we put the throne of God near Alpha Centauri, four and a half light years away, okay? So that, that's what I'm talking about. But I hope in a discussion we can get to this because this is, now here is from early writings by Mrs. White. Um, oops, I'm sorry. <coughs> Then there was a mighty earthquake. The graves were opened, and the dead came up clothed with immortality. The 144,000 shouted, Alleluia, as they recognized their friends who had been torn from them by death. And in the same moment, we were changed and caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. We all entered the cloud together and were seven days ascending to the sea of glass. There. There. Seven days. With what we know, we got nowhere in seven days except <laughs> a lot of empty space. I'm sorry, that, that was part of this picture, the schematics of the saved standing on the 144,000, a perfect square standing in a sea of glass. So it may be concluded that either there exist shortcuts beyond the three dimensions of the universe or that, or that heaven has transportation modes that far exceeds the speed of light. And there may be other possibilities. It's just these are the two that occurred to me. So <clears throat> when the Lord created the Earth and the solar system, there, was already, there were already billions of galaxies. Um, and further billions of stars, an unnumbered world. We are latecomers to the universe. And Mrs. White writes that all heaven took a deep and joyful interest in the creation of the world of man. Human beings were a new and distinct order. Man was to bear God's image, both in outward resemblance and in character. So <clears throat> we have to ask, the Lord doesn't just create because he has nothing else to do. He has purpose. And what was the purpose for our creation? That's was a big question. And the information we have that we are unique in that we resemble the Lord in a very special way. 
So what do we do with this information? So I'm offering my suggestion, again, totally subjective. Humanity was created to be a blessing to the universe. Bearing the creator's image, unfallen humans were well suited to be a link between the Lord and the rest of creation. And of course, that's before we fell. And now, it may be that through eternity, saved humans will have tra traveled from New Earth to the farthest reaches of the universe, testifying to the saving grace of Jesus. I certainly see this as, a, as something that may occupy some of our time throughout eternity. It's not necessarily a full-time job, maybe a part-time job. Now, coming to the creation account, I just want to make a few comments here. <coughs> First is that the creation account in Genesis 1 is given as if the writer was present at the time of creation. It's an eyewitness account. And how do we account for this? I find Mrs. White's comments on patriarchs and prophets, page 83, very helpful. Adam had learned from the creator the history of creation. The antediluvians had phenomenal memories. They simply remembered everything. And for this reason, they did not need to write down anything. Adam and Eve lived to talk to their descendants seven generations away. So the way I see it is after the flood, the authentic story of creation coming from the Lord himself continued from generation to generation to the lineage of Abraham and when Moses was standing sheep in the wilderness, he wrote the book of Genesis. These are the first words of the Bible. Bereshit, bara, Elohim, hashamayim, haaretz. And I don't know how to pronounce these two connecting words. Pardon me? Yeah. Et. Et and this? V. It's a V, huh? Yeah. V. Yes. Okay, okay. There's so, no uh, okay. Um, <coughs> bara is translated as created because in English language is a very po impoverished language, only 500,000 words in it, but it's very, very rich in, in words, but it does not have the equivalent of bara. Bara, the English, the Hebrew bara said, implies or states bringing into existence okay, from nothing. Dr. Bernard Taylor uh, gave a lecture that I heard, and that in his lecture he remarked only he, the Hebrew has this word with this kind of meaning, the bara. After the lecture, I had to go up to him and inform him that my mother tongue, the Hungarian, also has the same word. In Hungarian, it's teremt, teremt, T-E-R-E-M-T. -E -E uh, it means exactly the same thing, bringing into existence from nothing. Uh, nobody, we cannot uh, bring into existence from nothing. So, for instance, when we call in English the dear Lord creator, we are not giving full credit to the meaning. In Hungarian, we call the Lord the same way, teremtő which means the one who brings into existence from nothing. We just have that fortunate situation. <clears throat> um, I also want to mention that when the Lord brought into existence the earth out of nothing, he violated the first law of thermodynamics, which states that the energy matter content of the universe is constant. That's a given. That's when thermodynamics is built on. The Lord did not in consult the chemists. He just went ahead and <laughs> created a new matter. It is clear that the Lord is not subject to the laws of thermodynamics, although, of course, the laws of thermodynamics are very, very valuable, and they work. The Elohim is plural. The singular is Elohenu. We just comment on it. And then there is this unfortunate translation from Hashemaim of heavens. I checked a number of um, English translations and almost invariably they translate it as 
heavens. And the, the problem with the word heavens is that conscientious believers of the Bible take this English translation of the word Hashemaim and postulate that the universe was created at, um, during creation week. And then we have this tremendous problem of defending it, or they have this defend, defend, tremendous problem of defending this almost indefensible um, belief. But they, they simply think they're following the Bible conscientiously. The Hashemaim, the literal translation is sky. So in the beginning, the Lord brought into existence out of nothing the sky and the earth. Again, uh, just a last plug for the Hungarian Bible, but this is what the Hungarian Bible starts with. The Lord created the sky and the earth in the beginning. All right. The question is, when did that happen? How long ago did the Lord create? Of course, we have the um, 4004 at the margin of the King James Version. And everybody knows if the King James Version was good enough for Apostle Paul, it's good enough for us. <laughs> but uh, how do we, does the Bible have any information regarding the date of creation? And there is information in the Bible, in fact, to, to dig this number out. And 1 Kings 6.1 is the key text. And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel that he began to build the house of the Lord. <clears throat> 965 BC, 480 years before that was the Exodus then using this information, 1445 BC. Uh, Abraham and uh, the Exodus happened 430 years, according to this text, after Abraham entered Canaan in 1875 BC. And Abraham was 75 years old when the, he came into Canaan. So Abraham was born 1950 BC, 290 years before, after the flood. The date of the flood, according to these numbers, is 2000. 240 BC, and the flood came 1656 years after creation, which will bring it back to 3896 BC. If we take 3896, 3, add 2016 to it, and subtract 1, because there is no zero year, we come out with the age of the Earth, 5911 years. I just want to offer that this fall was Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. And Jewish people have been keeping track of, of the age of the earth. And the age, the, the year, this year, this fall was 5,777 in a, in a Jewish um, culture, which is 134 years, 134 years less than 5,911, I take this extremely satisfying because we're dealing with a lot of uncertainties here. So I, I, I think this is quite significant. Um, this lady is trying to take a picture of this slide. I don't want to take it off until she finishes. All right? Thank you. Thank you. If anybody wants any of this material, of course, it's more than welcome. The, the one point that, of course, we all know, but we don't talk about it, is the crucial information from the creation story, which cannot be arrived in deductive reasoning. And when it's ignored, it, it leads people totally in the wrong direction, is simply that the earth and everything on it were created with an apparent age. So <laughs> this did not come out too well. Let me read to you the Garden of Eden had mature fruit-bearing trees. Adam and Eve were adults. All of the creatures examined by Adam for the purpose of naming were differentiated into two genders. <coughs> and so I am now stepping out of this info, biblical information and extrapolating again. This is just to bolster my personal worldview is that 
One possibility is that the apparent age was consistently present everywhere on Earth, not only in the biological realm, but in the inorganic, non-living realm as well. Meaning that, for instance, when we have a, a radioactive material uh, deposit, that some daughter elements were already there at creation. It was not set, the radioactive clock was not necessarily set to zero at creation. And if we had some daughter elements present, it just renders all radioactive dating other than the carbon-14 dating useless. I also want to note that we have no historical data on any human civilization prior to 4000 BC, and there is no single cradle of civilization. Rather, uh, independent, parallel civilization uh, popped up in several areas, Mesopotamia, Egypt, Indus Valley, Yellow River Valley, Meso Mesoamerica, and South America, as if perfectly in harmony with our understanding that after the flood, humanity, and after the Tower of Babel, humanity scattered on the earth. So the estimated dates may not line up exactly with biblical dates, but they support the idea that sophisticated civilization sprung up suddenly in the recent three to 5,000 BC past. Um, I want to call attention to the undisputable evidence that the week as the unique time is essentially universal and there is no astronomical phenomena to base the week, the observance of the week on other than the creation week. And then in the languages, the word Sabbath is embedded in a number of languages as the designation for the seventh day. So we have, in Hebrew, we have Shabbat, Spanish, Sabado, Russian, Subotu, Hungarian, Sombat, Ancient Babylonian, Assyrian, Sabatu, Coptic, Pai Sabaton, Ancient Libyan, Ahal Esab, Esab. And that's just a short list. There could be much larger list. But we do not have any explanation of how the word Sabbath got in to all of these wide variety of languages other than what we know Sabbath is about. One more comment on creation, and that is this phrase that you read in Genesis 1, that God saw everything that he had made, and he did, it was good. The Lord apparently is doing a quality control on his creation. Why would that be necessary if the Lord simply carbon copied a million other planet, planets, if our Earth is simply a duplicate of other worlds that the Lord has made a million times before, there would not be any need for, for this event, the Lord, to check what he has made. My take from this is that we are unique. We are unique. The Lord created something new, and so it required a thorough examination and evaluation. Now, there were two basic type of organisms that were created by the Lord, organisms with nervous systems, humans, animals, fish, birds, and insects. And the second category, organisms without, without the nervous system, plants, trees, flowers, microorganisms. These are the biorobots. Give you examples of these. And biorobots were created to support the lives of organisms with the nervous system as food and shelter. So biorobots already died in the Garden of Eden every time Adam swallowed his saliva or when animals grazed on vegetation. Here in the middle is my life's work. I worked with E. coli for many, many decades. And those of us in the... Um, E. coli society, the world of E. coli, we also divide living organisms into two categories. One category is the coli, and the other is the uncoli. All right. 
So we talk about billions of galaxies, um, tremendous distances, and it's naturally to feel that we are quite insignificant. And to, to just uh, counter this thought, I wanted to take you to where I feel most comfortable, the microorganisms and to my research, and, and show a little bit of the care and richness of inventiveness the Lord manifested in microorganisms. Uh, this is a phase contrast microscope because uh, microorganisms, the index of refraction is almost like water. So normally you cannot visualize even on the microscope uh, microorganisms, but the phase contrast does that. So you don't have to kill the organism by staining. You can watch them swim around. And of course, using electron microscopy, you can really see more details of E. coli. Um, and I want to remind you that microorganisms are essential for life on, on the planet Earth in that they convert the nitrogen from the air to nitrates and nitrates, and plants cannot grow without nitrogen. And they're also primary agents for recycling of important uh, elements. So microorganisms were uh, part of the original creation, the way I see it. Um, I just want to give you a sense of appreciation for bacteria. This is a picture of a chemical factory. And E. coli can synthesize more than 3,000 different substances from glucose. <coughs> and this is on par with DuPont or Dow Chemical. The, this miniature microorganism is a chemical factory, fully automated, and it replicates itself under favorable conditions in less than an hour, maybe sometimes in 20 minutes. So it is really a technical marvel. But the, the one thing that you may not be aware is the enzyme alcohol dehydrogenase in our liver. When I took biochemistry, my teachers remarked how strange that we have alcohol dehydrogenase in our liver because human metabolism does not produce any alcohol. What is it doing in the liver? <clears throat> what it does is it converts alcohol to acetaldehyde. Alcohol gets into our blood, not through our metabolism, but by the bacterial metabolism in our colon. Were it not for alcohol dehydrogenase, Adam and Eve would have walked around half inebriated. <clears throat> the very presence of alcohol dehydrogenase is proof that the Lord meant to have E. coli in our colon. Now, you may wonder, what is E. coli doing? The most important role for E. coli is to create an anaerobic environment. It scavenges all the oxygen from the, from the gut because there are organisms to which oxygen is toxic. <clears throat> um, there was some talk about the chromosome of E. coli, or e. coli before in a few uh, lectures before, and I want to just show you that the chromosome of E. coli is very different from uh, eukaryotic cells in that it fills the uh, cytoplasm, and it's very accessible to ribosomes so that if a gene is turned on, it results in the synthesis of a protein in, in minutes very, very quickly. It doesn't have to go through the nucleus and so on. Um, now, I want to just take you, I know your eyes will glaze over this, but um, this is the biosynthetic pathway of a substance called coenzyme Q or ubiquinone. You may see air commercials on TV. I'm um, not sure the name. Q no. CoQ10, yes. Uh, e. coli makes CoQ8, Co Co coenzyme Q8 instead of 10. That just means that the carbohydrate, the hydrocarbon chain is two carbons shorter on the side. It really makes no difference. Anyway, one step here, uh, it's, it's a removal of a carboxyl group here, going to here, supposed to be catalyzed by two proteins called UBID and UBIX. And 
my graduate student, Haita Zeng, and I decided to study, compare the regulation of, of these two uh, supposedly isofunctional, these two proteins supposed to do the same thing. So we decided to study it. And when we sat down, the, the first step is to isolate the genes for these two, two proteins. And then it was then that we discovered that nobody knew where the UBID gene was. Nobody knew what the amino acid sequence and so on. So our first task, if we wanted to do what we set out to do, was to find the UBID gene. And uh, through quite an adventurous way, we succeeded in locating the UBID gene on the chromosome. It turned out to be uh, a dislocation on the chromosome, a 497 amino acid residue protein. And, and so what I want to do now is exit from this PowerPoint and take you somewhere where you have never been before, not that you want to be necessarily, and that is to introduce you face to face with the chromosome of E. coli. Um, let me tell you what I'm talking about. The chromosome of E. coli consists of, oops, what happened here? Oh, I'm not, I'm not showing this. Ay, 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 ay. Thank you, thank you so much, Paul. Invaluable. Mm. So, basically, um, very few people have the privilege of looking at the chromosome of E. coli. Uh, you, if you go, go to a book, you will read that E. coli chromosome has 4,639,675 nucleotides. Well. So that's, that's a nice big number, and so what? Um, the way that the chromosome is represented is by nucleotide sequence. There is an unending sequence of A, T, C, and G. Adenylic acid, thymidylic acid, guanylic acid, cytidylic acid, and they are linked by phosphoester bonds. And the nucleotides are numbered. Is arbitrarily, there is a nucleotide number one. It's in a circle, by the way. And so the, just pick the, the scientists picked a, number, uh, a nucleotide and numbered it one. And next to it, in a circle, was the last, the 4,639,675. 4, but they cut the circle. So we are representing the nucleotide sequence um, as a linear. So this is the first nucleotide sequence in the, chromo in the database is an A, OK? And then it continues. And what I want you to appreciate, that this nucleotide sequence represents the information that is required by E. coli to reproduce itself and to see the extent of this, OK? So, the, this, these are the, this is the nucleotide sequence. And uh, we're up to page 10. Um, the total sequence is 1144. The gene that I want to show you is on page 992 on this, and I will show it to you. But I want to just let you um, luxuriate your eyes on this unending series of A, T, G, and C in an apparently random sequence. Pardon me? Oh, I, I will go back. I will go back. Um, to, to, to an observer, it, it's simply the sheer magnitude. But, but you say to yourself, well, OK, um, how about you know, any random, you can, you can put any, any random sequence here to represent. And what I want to show you is that, at least in our case, this sequence is absolutely essential. I'm going to now zoom down for the sake of your time and you, uh, before you throw me out of here. Um, I'm up to 664. I have to go down to uh, 900. 
All right, 997, I think I overshot it. So here, here we go. So here is, here is the beginning of UBID. We're talking about the UBID gene. There are um, three times 497, so it's about 1,493 bases here in red. This is the UBID gene that we have to isolate and work with. Um, and there is a mutant of E. coli which cannot make coenzyme Q. And so we took the UBID gene out of that mutant organism and analyzed the UBID gene and we found one difference. You see this GGG here. This is a code for the amino acid glycine in the E. coli, which works fine. In a mutant organism that could not produce coenzyme Q, this G changed to an A. So this code became AGG, and it was coding, instead of for glycine, it was coding for arginine, a very different amino acid that has a positive side chain. So that change, that one nucleotide change, was enough to destroy the ability of E. coli to produce coenzyme Q. It could not make coenzyme Q. As a result of that, E. coli could not grow in the presence of air any longer. It had a profound consequence. This is an illustration from my personal experience of the specificity that is required to produce a working functional <coughs> E. coli. And we're talking about a tiny little organism here. Um, of course, it's all the coli are represented here. So let me go to the last uh, page to show you, <coughs> just to give you a sense. I'm sorry, I thought it's, oh, it's 11.44. <clears throat> this is the end of the chromosome, the last page. So I wanted to show you this C. See, this C is right next to the first nucleotide, A, that we started out with. OK. Thank you for being patient with me on this. Now, I wanted to go back to the I may not be able to, but hopefully I can get back to the, um, um, just we're almost done here. We're going to go back here. And um, let me go back to the last slide. <clears throat> Just bear with me, forgive me for not being very sophisticated here. Um, so here is what I'm saying. Scaling down from the mind-boggling gigantic dimensions of the universe to the mind-boggling miniature dimensions of the bacterial chromosome, some 23 orders of magnitude, we see no diminishing of the sophistication, complexity, and care by the creator. E. coli was designed with this much, if, if E. coli was designed with this much care, we can borrow from the Sermon on the Mount how much more solicitude the Lord has for us. Um, in, two, in the year 2000, there was an exhibit in London, the Millennial Dome exhibit, and Shirley and I were fortunate to visit that. And here's a picture of Shirley in front of a stack of 3,000 phone books which the caption said, this represents the information content of the human chromosome. Uh, approximately 1,000 time, 1, times as much as what's in E. coli. So I close with the word of the psalmist. I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all the marvelous works. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Okay. Okay, so.
Thank you so much for being patient and You said that E. coli reproduces once an hour or even faster than 20 that. Minutes 20 minutes under minutes. various advantageous conditions. How does an E. coli that's going to reproduce, reproduce all those bases in 20 minutes? Yes. And separate out without getting tangled? Yes. How does it do it? Yeah, the, that's uh, my question. The chromosomal replicating apparatus is a marvelous device attached to the inner membrane, and it appears that there is a mechanism that shuttles it through. Uh, the, the, the chromosomes are pushed through a device attached to the inner membrane, which replicates. When you say, are you using an S on the chromosomes, or uh, this is one chromosome? One chromosome. It? a single circular chromosome. Now, the details of that um, replication is usually a subject of a very intense hour to the medical students that their eyes glaze over because we have something like 50 different proteins that are doing 50 different things. Among them, and that is that may be worth mentioning, every time there is a replication, the cell comes to within inches of its death because the, the DNA is intertwined and as it's replicating, there has to be a separation of the strands. And as the strands separate, there is tightening along the edges of the double strand. And so there we have cutting enzymes that cut both strands of the enzyme, both strands of the DNA, and hang on to it to, to reverse the tightening. But if the enzymes let go of the DNA, the cell dies. So every time the cell replicates, it comes within inches of its death. It's an incredible system. And think of the possibility of how, by accident, you could generate by trial and error an enzyme that cuts both strands of the DNA and hangs on to it. Suppose, you know, by trial and error, just a little slip here, a little slip there. Yes, please. So it's still not clear to me, because they talk about all these mutations that are occurring Mut all the time, and, and, and you're implying that even a little bit of a mutation, the cell does not able to survive. The, um, so so my, resolve that issue of what, yes. how much capacity for mutations before the, it kills the the the, the protein, for instance, the UBID protein has 496 amino acids. And when we lined it up against other proteins that are similar, we have certain regions on the DNA, on, on a protein that we see consensus. Uh, amino acids. Certain amino acids occur in every parallel molecule. And these are the critical, these are called the, the evolutionary, my el evolutionary colleagues call it a conserved uh, residues. And if these change, then it's fatal or very, very consequential. There are indeed regions along the amino acid sequence, when if one amino acid changes into another, there will be no consequences. So I did not mean to imply, but perhaps I did, come across as every nucleotide is essential. There are some uh, give and take within a protein. But in my case, and, and there are many, many cases, there aren't. So what, what per, do we have a sense of the percentage of con conserved I, regions I, that is necessary? It varies or? from protein to protein. In this, so in, like ten percent or ninety percent or in in the UBID, I, I'm just visualizing the the sequence. I have not calculated this, Mickey. Um, I I would guess about fifteen to twenty percent. That has to be conserved. That, that appears for survival. To be, that has to be very critical for the shape of the protein to be maintained. So, so it is quite specific. Thank you so much.
there, uh, if you remember Doug Axe's uh, material, um, he was estimating that um, perhaps on the average you could have three or four different amino acids per position. Some of them are one. Some of them are probably 20. Um, but, you know, three or four. But that means that the other 16 or 17 would not be acceptable. And it also depends on if you have five or six errors somewhere, then the seventh error may be enough to dump it off. In other words, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a matter of once you get one, you're fine. Because if you have four or five of them off, then the sixth one may be enough to completely disorganize the protein. Um, yeah, four or five, uh, four or five amino acids. Amino acids. Uh, Paul, you're absolutely correct. And I, I should have mentioned that amino acids come in different categories. There are some positive side chain, negative side chain, hydrophilic and hydrophobic. And so if there is a change, within the category of a positive, one positive is changed to another positive or one hydrophobic to another one, that will have less of a consequence than it's a drastic different right. type of amino acid. In, in the case of UBID, we went from a neutral amino acid to a positive side chain, and that just wiped it out. Yeah, and what Doug is saying is that um, if you put all of those together in the proteins that he specifically analyzed, um, the chances of getting it by just randomly picking proteins are something in 1 to 10 to the 74th, okay. which is a lot less than 1 in 10 to the 160th, but it's still a very, very small number. <laughs> Thank you. Now, uh, there's yeah. one other thing that probably, uh, although I, it, as, as the DNA is being fed through this thing, if you'll remember, it's a helix. It's a yes. spiral. Yes. Um, it's going around and around, and uh, and that means that you have to untwist it. That's what I was talking and about. A you have to separate gyrases. The gyrases are but they not it. only they have to cut it, but they have to hold on to it and allow it to spin. Exactly, on the other reverse. End. Exactly. Well, it's not not just a helix. It's it's there, like there super cold, so you don't even have access to the sites. Unless it's unwound, yes, right? Yes, that is becoming a gray area. How, how, do, uh, how do we get through the supercoiling inside a cell? I don't know the degree of supercoiling in a cell. Uh, so there, I, I so that's in question now, you mean? Or we just don't that's understand my, that? my personal um, ignorance on that. Well, like uh, sickle cell, I mean, one substitution, one amino acid substitution completely alters the... Well, well, yes, now we're talking about different, you know, hemoglobin and so on. So, so it could yeah. be that one amino acid difference might kill it, too. Right? It, it could inactivate the protein, but as Paul mentioned, it, it's not just tinkering with, if you tinker with one area of the amino acid sequence, it has effect elsewhere, the, the, because it interacts. And it and could so affect the conformational shape it will, so that it doesn't... It can then, have untold consequences, yeah. and so it's safer to stick with, with the original. But <clears throat> the amount of, of thought and inventiveness that, that goes into our existence down from the... I, I'm talking about E. coli. Mickey is a physician, so he has a different perspective. But it's just totally, um, totally off the chart. And, and scientists spend all of their time <coughs> trying to figure out how things are working. We give Nobel Prizes to people who discover and explain to us how things are working, which was put there by the dear Lord. E. coli, isn't that what, you, what causes diarrhea? Okay. So E. coli, the rogue E. coli gave a terrible name to, to the poor Innocent E. coli. We all carry Escherichia coli in our colon, and it's our friend. But there are rogue 
varieties that acquire the toxic plasmid that causes diarrhea and other things. Um, but under normal circumstances and when you work in a laboratory, they are harmless and they're your friend. Oh, okay. put it <laughs> and, and we know more about E. coli <coughs> than any other organism except maybe the human. I mean, and, and what we learned from E. coli, we extrapolated to other organisms. So my professor once said, Jokingly, an elephant is just like an E. coli, only more so. <laughs> uh, just might mention, you know, uh, 100, 150 years ago, we knew nothing about this at all. A whole new universe of uh, biochemistry and DNA has come into being. Uh, but I sit and wonder about the you talked about the universe and this level, yes. about the subatomic level. We've got, uh, some suggest at least 56 different subatomic particles, uh, and counter particles, and so on. And, underlying uh, this reality. Underlying this, and uh, quantum mechanics comes in here and so on. There may be a whole level of complexity down there that we're just scratching the surface on like scientists were scratching 100 years ago on this kind of material. And so uh, we're not through with this question of uh, irreducible complexity. No. I visualize, or I, I have this little illustration, if we represent total human knowledge as a sphere, and as knowledge grows, so inside the sphere is what we know, and outside the sphere is what we don't know. The interface between what we know and what we don't know is our extent of ignorance. You know, we, we, and so as we investigate and our knowledge grows, the sphere grows, and so does the surface. With our knowledge, our ignorance also grows. We, and, and so your question simply illustrates that we're in a position to ask more and more questions to which we don't have answers. And this is fine. Uh, scientists are not up upset because if everything would be known, they would be out of business. So they love a challenge, but along with the, the increased knowledge, we should have, we should have humbleness. And, and, and instead, what I see out there, especially in the world of creation evolution, is a tremendous hubris that people talk in those terms as if they would know everything. And it's disconcerting. I'm Sorry. interested in the application to Eden <laughs> and creation. Now, when you talk about uh, bacteria, we have oh my, all kinds in our bodies. How many, how many different types of bacteria we, we don't are even in our know bodies. we don't we even don't know. know it's an un, uncharted, okay, territory, uncharted territory but 99 or 98 or 99 percent of all of those microorganisms are are harmless or beneficial okay. that's adding to the point i'm leading up to if you examine the soil and the production of soil so that plants can grow there's a whole universe of bacteria in the soil, right? Now, you go back to creation. God created the soil, right? So he must have created the bacteria to keep that cycle going of yes. reproduction. Yes, so the cattle. It makes sense. Cows, for instance, I don't know if you know. Cows eat grass, but mm -hmm. they cannot digest grass. No. So they have mm -hmm. microorganisms in their stomach that digest the grass and utilize the glucose. Mm -hmm. And so what they have in their stomach is a fermenter. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, yes. Please. So I feel bad that sometimes fellow Christians are laying the blame on Satan for all these marvelous productions. When, when you show the, just the DNA, the sequence, I mean, the complexity is just awesome. It, it's awesome. And we have a complex designer that 
Just and I forgot, I'm sorry, just I want to comment on this. I forgot to add that when you see this DNA sequence, you can isolate it, and it's nothing more than an inert piece of polymer. In order for that DNA to do its job, it requires a living cell to, to transcribe and translate what's on it. Okay? It's like you have a cassette tape, and without anything else, it's totally useless. So is the DNA. Please. There's some groups down in Florida and Texas that are studying the soil in depth. And what they've discovered is that there are some of these micro bacteria living in the soil that have a symbiosis with the roots of a plant. And when the plant is needing a certain type of material, like a phosphorus or aluminum or something like that, it will give that information to one of these very Not selected much. microorganisms, and it will then travel through the soil, find a source of that material, and bring that material back to the root of the plant as a transport within the soil itself. And this microorganism actually will move through the soil to find it. And they have discovered that one of these microorganisms evidently traveled a mile in the soil to f identify and find what the plant was needing and bring it back to the plant. Fascinating. Remarkable. What, fascinating what's going on in the soil that we stand on and plow under and, <laughs> and, and, <we> think <laughs> and it's put, put our, put our little, little tomato plants in yeah. and be thankful that the the tomato plant probably gives us a tomato, and we don't realize that all of this is going on unseen, the underneath scenes. the ground, which we don't even see. Yeah. But these microorganisms have a symbiosis with the roots of the plant themselves. Fascinating. And, the, and of course, the nitrogen, that the nitrates are also right. the result of fixing right. the air, same nodules. Right. I mean, the, the, as, like, as like, one, like David said, we're fearfully and wonderfully, wonderfully made. Wonderfully made. The whole yep. world is made that way, and we do not know uh, just a fraction of it. Yes, please. I think you, this, all that our talk here lately is an illustration. You know, Ellen White says, when we are in eternity, we'll never stop learning. No. And I think this is a an excellent example of how the smaller it goes, the more worlds you see. That's how God is. And that, that's to me, is one of the, the greatest wonders of, of the universe. Thank there, you, right thank you. Uh, yes, yes. No, we, we live in a wonderful, it's a wonderful life, you know, the movie title, but it's so true. It's so true in every way. And those of us who have been blessed to study the, the natural world in science, we are fortunate to, to take glimpses, get glimpses of it. And it's, I think below, our task is to, to carry it and, and share what we discover with those who don't have the privilege of, of looking at the chromosome of E. coli. Thank you so much, and have a wonderful Sabbath and a Merry Christmas if I wouldn't see you. <laughs>